Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Conflict Advantage, Using Workplace Friction to Fuel Success. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a marketing manager at the Myers-Briggs Company. And before we get started today, just want to run through a few things. So our webinar today will be about an hour. Um, we are recording this webinar, so we will be sending out a copy of the recording and the slides a little bit later on in the week. So you don't have to previously write down a bunch of notes. We will send this to you. Um, there are a couple of uh, pieces in this webinar where we will be asking for your input, your thoughts. So when we do that, if you could make sure you're navigating to the questions box so that we can see your responses. Um, we also want to get actual questions from you as well throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions as we're going through the content, please feel free to submit those at any time and we will answer them as best we can at the end or we will get back to you um, via email. So I will go ahead and hand it over to our expert for today, Marta. Thank you, Caitlin. All righty. So I am Marta Coons. I work full time for the Myers-Briggs Company as a consultant and certification faculty for our assessments. Today, we're going to be talking about the uh, conflict, right? So we're going to look at our research study around conflict, talk about some research findings that we got from that study. I'm going to introduce a conflict model that we utilize and recommend, and then we'll just bring the research study to a close and talk about some conclusions and recommendations that we have from that study. So here's me, Marta Coons. I do work, as I said, for the Myers-Briggs Company as a principal consultant, certification faculty for all of our uh, assessments, actually. So CPI 260, FIRO, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, Strong Interest Inventory, um, and the Beta Navis platform. My PhD is in depth psychology, so it's kind of a fun field to have a PhD in, do some studies. I'm also a professional certified coach, have been for some time, and I do bring that perspective to my work with our assessments. All righty, let's jump in to the research study. So just some highlights about who is in the demographics for this group. So we can see we had a fairly good mix, you know, gender-wise, 71% female, 28% male, 1% choosing to uh, self-describe or prefer not to say. Uh, had a pretty good age range, although you see at the tail ends, you know, 18 and 82, uh, not so many people there. See the bulk right in the middle, but it is actually a fairly good range for this study. We look at employment status for this study. Um, most people full-time, few part-time, few other, I'm not quite sure what other falls into there, but most full-time for this. We look at the country, yes, US centric for 61%, but that means that 39% were um, from the UK or the rest of Europe or the rest of the world. So it is a, a global sampling. In terms of job level, most of the folks in this study, non-supervisory employees, but we do see a fair number of management as well. If we put those numbers together from executive to top executive down to first level management, um, it really does bring that number up. So a lot of folks were in that management executive position, um, but also a, a larger number of non-supervisory employees. Alrighty, working remotely, that's always a big item these days, right? A topic that we're all discussing. What was that impact of so many people going to work remotely? If we see here, most of the people who are in this study had a mix, right? So there's a few people down there in the, yep, I'm full-time face-to-face, a few that are like, no, mostly working remotely. But we see this mix in the middle of, you know, uh, 11 to 20 percent, 81 to 90 percent. Most people are in that mix of, hey, I do some face-to-face -face and some remote. In terms of the size of the organization, most people in the study did have that larger organization they work with, but we do see a range from that just me, right, um, and then all the way from two to 1,000. So we do have actually a pretty good mix when we look at the size of the organization as well. Alrighty, so that's just a little bit about who's in the study. Let's look at some of the findings from that study. We're gonna look at four different areas. We're gonna look at conflict in the workplace, the impact of COVID, COVID and working remotely, the impact of managers, and then also 
job satisfaction. So let's go ahead and start with conflict in the workplace. To get that going, let's start with a poll. What do you think are the main causes of conflict in your workplace? Take a look at the five choices we have here. Which one would you consider the main cause of conflict in your workplace? Quite the range in there. Alrighty, so we see 9% changes in policy, etc. 26% dysfunctional teams. Heavy workloads, 14%, lack of role clarity, that 28%, and then personality flashes, 23 So it looks like that lack of role clarity is our highest one there. Let's go ahead and see what the research actually said. Main cause was actually poor communication, 47%. We do see that lack of role clarity, that we had at 28% is that second cause at 42%. Changes in policies, 30%. Dysfunctional teams down to 27%. Uh, let's see those heavy workloads up there at that 38%. Personality clashes, right, 37%. So I think we did a fairly accurate job of looking at that, although our heavy workloads was down sort of lower and we are at 38% of that. So if we look at these main causes of conflict, there's a range here, but poor communication definitely is the front runner at 47%. Lack of role clarity, close behind, right? Those heavy workloads, personality clashes, but it goes all the way down. Some people talking about you know, discriminatory behavior, bullying or harassment, recruiting or selecting the wrong people for the job. And we do have 8%. Right, that says, hey, there is no conflict in my workplace. I'm not sure who's lucky enough to be in those positions. Maybe it's the solo workers we talked, we had in our study. Don't know for sure, but a lot of us seem to be dealing with conflict. We look at the impact of conflict and how it makes us feel. Right, there's some obviously negative feelings we're seeing in here. Right, anxious, depressed, fearful, stressed. All right, awkward, uncomfortable. So lots of feelings in there that maybe are not the most fun to experience, especially on a regular basis. Now we do see 10% saying, hey, conflict can be useful. Wouldn't it be great if we could up that number and more people could see conflict as being a possibility, right? We have 7% saying, hey, excited, engaged, challenged. And that's what conflict can be. And we just need to flip that around a little bit and see, because yes, 6%, it does depend, right? So lots of these feelings and emotions, maybe less than positive, can have a negative impact on our work experience. But if we could flip that around a little bit to that conflict can be useful, or better yet, that excited, engaged, and challenged, that'd be kind of nice. Let's do another poll here. Overall, how do you personally see workplace conflict? Right? Always or almost always giving positive results, generally giving more positive than negative results, right? So a mix or getting into that space of more negative than positive. I think we have a clear front runner here as the poll is progressing. Right, well, we see 50% have that mix, 
positive and negative results, but not too far behind that generally giving more negative than positive results. So in our own experience, it does seem that yeah, a lot of us have had those negative impacts from conflict in the workplace. When we look at the research study and said, hey, overall, how do you see workplace conflict? We see that mix 52% to our 50%, followed by that more negative than positive 27%, we had it at 36%. Right? But if you compare our numbers and the research study, we find that the placings of these five are very similar. Right? So most of us are seeing that mix of positive and negative, negative results. In our, in our workplace conflict. Again, wouldn't it be nice if we could switch these numbers to having it generally giving more positive than negative results, if we could change the climate of, around conflict in our workplace. Because, hey, there are positive outcomes of workplace conflict, right? Relationships, collaboration, cooperation, better solutions, right? innovation, new perspectives. There's all sorts of potential positives to conflict. So if we look at this, we see, yeah, a lot of us have experienced those positive outcomes. And those are the ones we really want to experience in that, that conflict uh, situation. So here's the question, right? What other positive outcomes have you experienced personally when you've had workplace conflict? And Caitlin, I'm going to rely on you to. Yep, I am just letting a couple of them come on in. Okay, so we have personality insights, self awareness, how I'm showing up. It forces me to think outside of my own box, it strengthens relationships, clarifying differences and expectations understanding other perspectives, making programs better, a lot of understanding each other, got one that can be energizing, builds teamwork, so a lot of the same kind of, um, same kind of comments now, learning about yourself, greater commitment, builds teamwork a lot of times. Beautiful, thank you. Right, so lots of positive outcomes. Right? It seems that people didn't have a, a challenge putting some outcomes in there to add to what we're already seeing as some of these positive outcomes. But we know there are also negative outcomes. We don't want to just ignore those. Right? So negative outcomes of workplace conflict. It's, we see some of the things that, you know, how it made us feel, that anxiety, depression, stress. Right? But we see some things on here that can be pretty detrimental to our work experience, right? Toxic work environment, people on the edge, project delays, poor results, low productivity. So having an impact on the work that we do, but also having an impact on the individuals in that workplace. And you know, we want to figure out how we can reduce these negative outcomes and increase those positive outcomes. Now let's take a look at impact of COVID and working remotely. So we'll look at how has the COVID-19 pandemic and its after effects influenced conflict in your workplace? Most people, 44% said, hey, it hasn't changed. Right? But 34% said, no, there's been an increase in the amount of conflict we experience. Now, in some cases, 22%, it's actually decreased. So when I look at this, I get curious. I'm like, huh, I wonder, you know, who's reporting which, right? Who's looking at this and saying it's increased? Who's saying it hasn't changed? Who's saying hasn't, has, it's decreased for me? I'm not experiencing that as much. So look, let's look at this by work status. And we have non-remote, 
hybrid and remote. Now we see the no change is fairly stable across the three. There's a larger difference if we looked at conflict, conflict has increased and that conflict has decreased. So for remote employees, right, we see more of a reporting of conflict has decreased. And we see the largest impact of conflict post COVID uh, in terms of increasing are folks who are non-remote. So I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a researcher to some extent, so I look at this and I can get curious about it. And then I'm like, whoa, I'd love to ask my research team, can we do a little bit more to explore this, right? Uh, but we do see this conflict increasing more, more in those non-remote employees and for our remote employees, more of a decrease. Now let's look at the causes, right? Percentage of each group mentioning the different causes for this. And again, we can I'll take a, a few seconds here for us to really look at this. There's a few numbers on the table here. But we see that poor communication that was our top one, right? It was mentioned across the board, right? So more so for our non-remote workers. And if we think about that, you know, we're still face-to-face, -face, that communication is really key. But for hybrid workers, remote workers, that poor communication is a challenge as well. We see a bigger difference if we look at inadequate resources. Seems to be more of a concern for our non-remote workers. For our hybrid workers, that lack of transparency, openness, and honesty seems to be a challenge. And that poor line management. Again, there's that none, uh, no conflict in my workplace. Hybrid workers are not reporting that as much as our non-remote and our remote workers. So just interesting to see which causes seem to be more of a challenge based on your work status, your work environment there. So if there's gonna be conflict, which there is, right? We know people are gonna experience conflict. Who handles conflict most effectively? Again, let's look at this from these three categories, remote workers, hybrid workers, non-remote workers. It's, we look at our remote workers, eh, 58%, there isn't a difference based on your work uh, environment, remote to hybrid to non-remote, 58%. Right? That goes down a little bit more for those hybrid workers who say, you know what, hey, hybrid workers handle conflict most effectively. That bumped up to 21% for them. Our non-remote workers, Still that no difference with saying, yeah, 17% non-remote workers. So we handle uh, conflict a little bit better than our, our colleagues. So again, most people saying there wasn't a difference or not sure, we had a larger percentage there as well. Right? But hybrid workers were the ones who got that highest number in terms of who handles conflict most effectively. Now let's look at the impact of managers, right? What's the impact that our managers have on conflict? First of all, it seems that we're all in agreement that it's an important skill, right? If you're gonna be in a leadership position or management position, it's extremely important, 72%, right? That you know how to handle conflict. If we bump up that very important in there, right? That's 70, 98% say, yeah, you're going to be in that leadership role, you really do need to know how to handle conflict. So then if we go from there and say, hey, it's an important skill. Now let's flip that to what about your direct supervisor? How do they do it handling conflict? Adequate's the front runner there. Right? So very well, quite well. Right? We know it's an important skill, 98%, but only 46% of our managers do it well. I mean, adequate, adequate is just what it is, adequate, but wouldn't that be nice if we could flip that up and find a way so that our managers could learn a little bit better how to manage conflict. I mean, lots of things that they could do, right? So nothing more, 35%, but let's look at these other pieces. That's where I wanna focus my energy, right? Because we know there's that large percentage who are only doing things adequately. 
company. We could bump that percentage if people, if our managers in particular, could listen, ask for opinions more, views, information, communicate more regularly, address conflict quickly, directly, or early. Right? So we're seeing that those three at the top there are really all about communication, right? listening, speaking up, right? having a role early in that conflict. These might be the things that we want to focus on teaching our managers and leaders. Last section we're going to look at here before we look at a conflict model is job satisfaction. So first, because there is a, a link between how we manage conflict and job satisfaction, another poll. How well do you manage conflict personally? Where would you rate yourself? Very well, quite well, adequately, poorly, or very poorly? Those numbers coming in. Looks like we've got a few folks in that very well percentage, that top tier. <clears throat> Then we have most folks, 43% in that quite well, and then 44% adequately. So 44% of myself, and I would put myself probably in that space, yeah, adequately. I, I know for myself, I'd love to be better at managing conflict. And there's some simple things that we can do to get to that space of managing conflict more effectively. The other thing we know is there isn't a, a link between conflict and job satisfaction. Right. So if we look at the study, 49% said adequately. So we're a little bit <clears throat> more prepared to manage conflict, it looks. Our, our quite well grouping is at 43%, where the study gave us 34%. Right, Very well, we had 4%, they had 6.5. So very similar percentages, I would say, um, between the study and this group, which is another, you know, we just, the poll is another piece of research. That sort of affirms the research that we saw in this conflict study. It says most of us really wish we could do a better job at handling conflict. Now we're going to flip it a little bit to two, see the two sides of this um, bit of research here and then put them together. All right, so we saw that most people are saying, yeah, I handle it adequately. A little bit more, you know, a little bit lower number saying they handle it very well. Now we switch over to how satisfied are you in your current line of work? And most people are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. 38%, 34% very satisfied. But then we do have 20% saying somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, 5.3% dissatisfied, right? So we've got a group of our workers, 25, 26, 27% who aren't really happy in the work that they're doing. Now, what's the link? between conflict and job satisfaction. And so if we look at this, we've got how often you deal with conflict at work down the bottom there, all the time, very often, often, occasionally, never. And over on the left, we see that job satisfaction scale, and that mean level of job satisfaction. So if I'm dealing with conflict all the time, right, I mean that, somewhat satisfied category right? and it doesn't bump up you know it, the, the scaling is from one to six so we wouldn't expect to see a huge bump up necessarily but we do see that the less time we're dealing with conflict the higher our job satisfaction is right from dealing with conflict all the time being in that mm, somewhat satisfied category being up into that, never dealing with conflict, up into that satisfied category. So there is an impact on having to deal with conflict and how happy we are in the work that we're doing. Now, if we look at the number of hours that we're dealing with conflict for each level of job satisfaction, wow, there's a big difference here. Folks who reported very dissatisfied also reported dealing on average with conflict 16 hours. Right? 
weekly hours. Dissatisfied, 7.5, we'll see that goes down, a little blip in that somewhat satisfied, but people who are very satisfied only spend 3.9 hours a week dealing with conflict. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather be in that space of dealing with conflict less than four hours a week than in that space of dealing with conflict 16 hours a week. Right? I think I would be very dissatisfied with the work I was doing if I had to deal with conflict almost half of my working hours. So how do we get to that space of dealing more effectively with conflict? And by dealing more effectively with conflict, potentially and likely reducing conflict in our workplace. That's where our TKI assessment might come in and be a helpful tool. So first, we know that our managers and supervisors, said, eh, you know, they, they, they're okay, they deal with conflict adequately. We know that for everyone, how well do we deal with conflict? Again, most of us were in that adequately space. Right? Whose responsibility is it to ensure that conflict in the workplace is managed effectively? Yes, the line managers and supervisors, and we, we knew that, right? 98% of us said that was an important skill, right? But everyone, all of us, need to deal with conflict more effectively. Right? So how do we find that space where our supervisors and our work are empowered and feel comfortable to engage in conflict, to see conflict and its positive potentials. So if we look at conflict, I'm going to put this model out here. Now, there's probably other ways that we can respond to conflict, but here's a model that looks at our level of assertiveness and our level, level of cooperativeness. Now, it shows five main conflict models or conflict modes. The thing to remember about this model is none of them are bad or good. They're just different ways to deal with conflict. They all have their time and their place. So highly assertive and highly collaborative or highly cooperative is that collaborating mode. Down to that unassertive and uncooperative mode of avoiding. But avoiding has its time and place as well, right? We see high assertiveness, low cooperativeness, is that competing? We see low assertiveness, high cooperative, is that accommodating? And then somewhere in the middle, is that compromising? Now, what would it be like for you and your workplace, right? And your supervisor and your employees Right? If our workers, if everyone had this understanding of these conflict modes and knew what their go-to mode was and knew what the go-to mode was for other people that they work with, whether it be face-to-face -face or remote or somewhere in the middle, right? what would that difference be? Now, folks who have completed the TKI assessment Right? and there were uh, a number of them in uh, this research study, said, hey, you know what the difference would be? Is that I would be increasing my own self-awareness, 73%, and have a better understanding of how I impact other people. Understand my typical approach to conflict. Understand other people's typical approach to conflict. And then 47% said, hey, I could deal with conflict more effectively. I'd love to be in a workplace where 47% of the people knew how to deal with conflict more effectively. So there are some benefits for learning and understanding a model that explores the different conflict modes that we're likely to see. So let's explore those five modes. First one again, competing, unassertive and cooperative. Now, when we're in that competing mode or using that mode, because even though we have one that tends to be our go-to mode, our goal is to be able to step back and realize, wait, there's different ways that I could respond to this conflict. Which one makes the most sense? Sometimes competing makes the most sense. Right? Attempt to satisfy the other person's concerns at the expense of your own. Unassertive and cooperative. Oh, that is not the right one for competing. Competing is assertive and uncooperative. Right, where it's all about meeting my needs and not the needs of the other person. 
collaborating, assertive and cooperative. We're trying to find that win-win solution that completely satisfies both people's concerns. Now, as you can imagine, I mean, collaborating takes a bit more time. Right? It's not as simple uh, in terms of time spent as maybe something like avoiding, but the outcome has the potential to be that win-win for both parties. Compromising, right? That's that imp intermediate place of like, well, I'll get some of my needs met, you'll get some of your needs met. Can we agree on that, right? We both, it's kind of a win-win-ish type thing, but we're not, no one's getting everything that they want, but everyone's getting something that they want. We have avoiding, which is unassertive and uncooperative. We're just gonna avoid that conflict altogether. Now, sometimes avoiding the conflict makes a lot of sense. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where it's harmful to us on any level, right? Sometimes it's just not the time, not the place. So avoiding can be positive, but avoiding can also be not helpful for ourselves, for the other person, for the situation that we're trying to work through. We have accom accommodating, unassertive and cooperative. Right? What can I do for you, right? Let's take care of the other person which sometimes is exactly what we need to do. But we wanna remember whenever we're accommodating someone else, we're tending to not meet our own needs. Again, they all have a time and a place. And so the question is, when do we use each of these? What's your go-to style? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Right? Have you ever you know, taken an assessment or had this um, information to explore and say, hmm, I think, you know, compromising, right? Or collaborating. Oh, I never do competing. How does that serve you? How does it not? So having this self-awareness, again, that that 73% of people said, yeah, this is the first um, and most consistent outcome of exploring this is I have an awareness of, hey, this is my go-to style. And then we want to have that conversation of, well, does my style work for me? When does it make sense? to use competing, to use accommodating, to be in that collaboration space, right? because they all have a time and a space. Let's look at this, and there's a handout for everyone in uh, the handout space there, if you wanna download that. We're gonna apply these five different conflict modes to a common situation, coffee. Now, I'm personally not a coffee drinker, but many people are. So let's look at a situation around coffee. You're the supervisor of a department. Your staff has organized a committee. Right? And that committee is going to discuss the location of the office coffee maker and its effect on their productivity. So just for the sake of this situation, we're going to say we're all working together, non-remote. Coffee maker is currently located outside your office, but that's on a different floor than the work area. Right? The committee feels that the time it takes them to visit the coffee maker slows down their workflow. So a representative from the committee comes to you with a proposal to move the coffee maker from its current location to a location that is central to the staff work area. But they need your approval to submit a work order for the move. So they've come to you and they said, hey, we want to move it. This is where we want to move it. How do you respond? Now, there's different ways you can respond. We're not saying they're all, you know, this is one right way to do it. There definitely can be more than one right way, but let's explore this together. So if your response is, I don't agree that the location of the coffee maker affects productivity, what would you classify that as? Competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, or accommodating? Go ahead and put that into that poll that we've just started there. I don't agree that the location of the coffee maker affects productivity. Ready. So 
So let's see what we've got here. <clears throat> Looks like most people said competing, 66%, followed by avoiding at 23%. So how would we classify this response? So most, I would say, competing. Now, I do agree that it could be, might be avoiding depending on the energy that went with the response, right? Now, if someone's just saying, nope, this is it, I don't agree, we're just leaving it where it is, right? then that's probably that competing, that assertive and uncooperative. Right? It's all about what I want. I want it where it is. I'm the supervisor, it's staying where it is. I don't agree, we need to change it. Now, maybe it's a conversation that this person just doesn't want to have. Right? They are in that avoiding space. So they're like, no, I don't agree with that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go there. We're not going to have that conversation. Right? Maybe they're avoiding it because uh, it's not the time and the place to have that. So it could be avoiding. Most times I would say though, that that person saying, you know, I just don't agree with it. And again, it could be that follow up. We're just gonna leave it where it is, would be that competing space. How about this one? I don't have time to discuss the coffee maker right now. Which one do you think that is? Competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, accommodating. And again, you do have that on the handout you were able to download. What do we think for this one? So it seems to be getting more of a clear consensus. Yeah. So we see the poll tells us 96% said avoiding. And yeah, I would agree on this one that probably avoiding, right? Don't have time to discuss the coffee maker right now. Now, it might be I'm avoiding it because I just don't want to have this conversation. Or maybe, maybe I need to collect more information about this. And so maybe it's not the right time to do it. But definitely that avoiding response. We could also have another response. Let's see if we can work together to find the best place for the coffee maker that meets the needs of the team, the executive team, and the client who visit our office. I think this one might be, and actually, um, Caitlin, let's not open the poll for this one. Let's just explore it together. And with this one, it's more that collaborating, right? It's trying to find the win-win, let's work together. Now, remember, we look at this situation. Let's see if we can work together to find the best place for the coffee maker that meets the needs of the team, the executive team, and the clients who visit our office. That's a lot of people to get on the same page. And so collaborating very often takes a little bit more time and energy to get to that place where we're meeting everyone's concerns. Everyone is getting their need met. Let's look together at this one. I can see that this is important to the team. I like it where it is, but let's move it. This is gonna be that space of accommodating. I might really like where it is, right? but if it's important to you, it's important to me. So let's go ahead and move it. That's that accommodating. Now again, each one of these has their time and space. I'm not sure the new location would work best for the individuals who work near my office. Maybe we could move it to a location halfway between the workspaces. That's going to be that compromise. It's probably going to be in a space that nobody really loves where it is, but let's work together. You know, I'll give a little, you give a little. Right? So it's a little bit easier for you. It's a little less convenient for me, but maybe it's a good space for, for all of us overall. Different responses to the same situation. Right? What would it be like if we knew about these five possible ways of responding and we were really aware, okay, wait, there's these five ways and we could step back and choose the one that makes the most sense. Now, when we look at this, there's a way that I like to explore it, looks at the conflict pie. Right? Because all of these modes are about whose needs get met and to what extent. Now, avoiding, it depends. Are we doing what we call effective avoiding or ineffective avoiding? There's a time and a place to avoid, right? Because are my needs met and get? 
my needs getting met? Are their needs getting met? Not yet. Okay, that's effective. We're going to revisit it when the time is right. But ineffective avoiding, which is I'm just not going to go there ever, nobody's needs get met. Nobody gets any pie. When we're accommodating, my needs don't get met at all. They get all the pie. I get nothing. Compromising, you get some, I get some, we divide it in half. Competing, it's all about me, so I'm getting all the pie. My needs are getting met, but theirs aren't. Collaborating, now again, this is going to take the most time and energy, but it says, hey, we all kind of get the equivalent of a pie because we're going to just create a larger pie. Again, there's a time and a place for each of these, but creating that awareness of, hey, there's different ways that we can respond and there are different mixes of whose needs get met can be a really helpful model. Now that avoiding can be effective and ineffective, right? right? Effective avoiding says, hey, I'm just gonna put the brakes on for now right? because I need more information or I want things to die down a little bit, right? So it's a better time to explore it. Or maybe because, hey, this was really important, but it's not really important anymore. Ineffective avoiding, on the other hand, right? not really helpful. Right? That's the situation where, hey, this is actually a really important topic for us, right? but I'm just not comfortable with conflict, so I really don't wanna bring it up and have that conversation. So I'm just gonna keep walking the other way. Right? So avoiding has its time and place, but we wanna make sure it's gonna be effective avoiding if we're utilizing it. Right? What about questions here? What examples of effective avoiding can you think of? When is it that right time and place perhaps to use avoiding. Again, Caitlin, I rely on you. Yep, I am just letting them come on in. Some examples are when you don't have enough information if the benefit and the risk of taking action is outweighed by the downside potential, um, when under a deadline with other higher priorities, when you need time to self-reflect, um, when there isn't time to adequately discuss the issue, when the conflict does not directly involve you, um, when there are so many issues that you have to pick the most important, when you have to consider someone in higher authority than you, if it feels like it's a time sensitive issue, when the place is not right, like a staff meeting and there are other people that shouldn't be a part of the discussion, a lot about time, needing time to reflect or if the time isn't right. That is what I'm seeing. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, and all examples of when effective avoiding, right? When it makes sense to let's not go there right now. And it's important to know the difference and have that self-awareness. Am I avoiding because it's not the right time and place and I need more information? Or am I avoiding because I'm just not willing to go there? A Couple other things to think about with this model is collaborating looks like collaborating would be this is what we should do all the time right everyone's getting their needs met we're getting this huge pie right you get everything you want i get everything i want we just work together to find that space where we're all feeling satisfied with the outcome right? but it's not always the right time and place right we need to be in a space that we can deal with that stress because there's some stress involved with collaborating. Now, ideally it's, it is more of a positive stress, but it's still a higher stress level. We need more time, right? It can take a lot of time to get everyone on the same page, right? We need all the parties involved to sort of have that equal playing field and being able to have that higher level of trust, have that higher uh, level of interpersonal skills so we can have these conversations, right? So collaborating is, is a great, mode but they're all great modes when they're used appropriately and sometimes people first look at this and say of course i'm collaborative right i want to be collaborative that's the best one to be not always right because it is 
in, more intense on many different levels. Right? So sometimes it's not the right choice, even though first glance it seems like, oh, of course, collaborating, that's the one. Now, a couple other things we've got here, competing, accommodating, and compromising. Right? If we look at these, competing says, I get it all. Accommodating says, hey, you get it all. Compromising says, hey, we all get some. The thing to think about with this is they're all sort of win-lose. They're all, I get more, you get less, you get more, I get less, right? The pie stays exactly where it is. Now, when we, we look at these three, something to watch out for when we are working with the TKI report is, these are the folks who sometimes, if these are the three that come up most on their report, right? They're all about that win-lose scenario. They're not able to really vision the potential of a win-win situation. So while they can be helpful, all of them competing, compromising, accommodating, if that's all we're seeing with somebody, it makes me wonder about how do we get them to that space of seeing win-wins are possible, that it's not all about win and lose. Accommodating and avoiding, both that unassertive, right? but one is cooperative, one's uncooperative. And again, we want to look at this in terms of whose needs are getting met. And that's the core of this when we're looking at conflict, whose needs are getting met and to what extent. Right? Avoiding behave in a way that prevents both people from getting their needs met. Nobody gets their needs met when we're avoiding. Now, sometimes it's that effective avoiding, so we're gonna get our needs met later on, and accommodating, right? Behaving in a way that the other person gets their needs met and not me. So, okay to be unassertive, right? But really thinking about the fact that you are not gonna be on the winning side if there is a winning side, right? If we look at it from win-loss, your needs are not going to be getting met in either of those situations. So definitely we have that impact. Compromising and collaborating. Compromising says, hey, we both get our needs met, but not fully. But collaborating says, hey, we just make it a bigger pie. Right? And so being able to see that we're both getting our needs met to some extent, Collaborating takes more time, just like it takes more time to, to make a bigger pie, it takes more time to collaborate than to compromise. And then finally, let's look a little bit at conflict in teams. Now each team has its own conflict style. And we look, there's a perception of conflict, so each of those conflict styles has their own perception of conflict. Each of those conflict styles, so competing looks at conflict in a different way than collaborating. Right? Compromising looks at teammates different than avoiding. Right? Each conflict style has its own guiding principles, its own values. Right? This is important to realize. We also want to realize that each team is going to have their own style. They might have competing, that's our clear dominant style for dealing with conflict. Or maybe it's compromising, maybe it's accommodating. Sometimes the team will have two that sort of come in to, to play when they're dealing with conflict. And sometimes the team just doesn't have consensus on their conflict style, right? This can be challenging, right? If we're all trying to, to work on a situation together and I'm compromising and you're accommodating, this other person's avoiding and someone else is collaborating, someone else is competing, we're not on the same page. And if I don't understand that, oh, what I'm doing is compromising right now. Oh, this person is accommodating. Oh, that person's competing. And if they have that lens too, that's when we can get on the same page and get to those positive outcomes we wanted. Right? Because we want those positive outcomes for conflict. We want to flip from everyone feeling, eh, I'm adequate at this. Eh, there's a mix of positive and negative. Wouldn't it be great if we could get to that space of, hey, I deal with conflict effectively. So do my coworkers. And we're seeing these positive benefits that can come from conflict. Now, how do we get to that space? What are some of our recommendations? So 
Few things from the research study, the conclusions, is remember that dealing with conflict takes time, right? We've got to devote our time and energy to learning about conflict, how to respond to it. Now, we've got those three most common causes of conflict, poor communication, lack of role clarity, heavy workloads. That's a great place to start. If those are the most common causes of conflict, if we start there, chances are we're going to be more likely to see a reduction in conflict and to start to see conflict in a more positive way. Managing conflict at work, useful skill for everyone. Right? Remember we looked at that research and it said, whose job is it to, to respond to conflict? Right? Managers and everyone. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to teach this to my managers. They're all going to, my leadership is going to learn how to deal with conflict. Yes, they need to. 98% said, yep, that's important. But everyone needs to know how to manage conflict, no matter what their level or um, role within the organization. It's useful for all of us. We all are going to benefit from learning about conflict, how to respond to it, how to resolve issues. We all need to know how to manage that conflict. Especially important, as I said, for managers, right? 98%. So if we have to start somewhere, it's a great place to start. Remember, it can be positive. Most people said it's a mix. So people are starting to see, yeah, there's benefits here to conflict. The more we experience those positive results from conflict, the more likely we are to start to see, hey, Conflict can actually be healthy, right? It can actually get us to a space where we're seeing new ideas, innovations, positive relationships being built, better communication skills. So we want to start to see those positive outcomes more. Right, so those positive outcomes that we see the most, building relationships, increasing collaboration and cooperation, the negative ones, Poor relationships, loss of trust, breakdown of relationships, right? There's a theme here, right? That theme of relationships, of connecting, of collaborating, of cooperating. Right? Having an understanding of our conflict styles, of other people's conflict styles, of how we might respond, right, can get us into that better space, that seeing positives, seeing that relationships being built on a more positive foundation, increasing our collaboration and cooperation. Right? Point out that importance of understanding other people's approaches to conflict is a key aspect of any conflict training. We've got to understand that not everyone sees conflict in the same way. Alrighty, so we have a few minutes left. What questions, comments do you have around seeing these positive aspects of conflict, seeing it as a space that we can uh, see forward motion and progress. Okay, I do okay. have a couple. Yep, I have some questions for you that have already come in. So um, let me go ahead and kick us off. <clears throat> so the first one is um, okay. How do you recommend approaching conflict in a remote setting? And there's another comment with that that's more about how it seems like it's easier for people who are remote to avoid conflict altogether. So how would you approach it remotely? Yeah, so in a remote setting, um, it depends on what form the conflict, I think it's the same as face-to-face, -face, is what's the form the conflict is, to, is, is taking, right? So um, even in a, in a non-remote setting, people's conflict might take place over you know, emails as opposed to walking down the hall and having a conflict. So if is the remote setting conflict taking place by, you know, avoiding answering emails? Is it about uh, sending these clear, nope, we're doing it my way emails, which is all about that competing when it's not appropriate to be in that space? Is it about, hey, accommodating, you can have this, right? What's the form it's taking? Is it on, you know, when we have calls together, um, somebody's response, right? So I think there's a lot more similarity than difference in terms of how we might deal. And the first thing I would do is 
you know, train people, right? Have them have this awareness of, hey, when there's conflict, and it doesn't need to be, hey, let's deal with this conflict you're having, but kind of more of a broad brush, let's step back. Let's all learn about conflict. Let's learn about how we sometimes respond to conflict and get that awareness, you know, without you know pointing fingers at anyone. I think I would do that the same if we're face-to-face -face or remote, is just take this space of teaching everyone about conflict, create that awareness. And then once we have that common language, we're all gonna be in a better space to have those conversations. Great. Okay, um, and another one that's kind of similar to that, what's your recommendation to finding out why there is conflict? Digging into the why for each individual. Yeah, so I think it depends on the energy, right? So, um, you know, sometimes with an individual or a team, you know, it's that avoiding. Is it effective or ineffective avoiding? Um, if it's in the space where it's a real hot button issue, and people's tempers are up, probably not, not the best time to explore the why. Um, I might wait a little bit to find out what that why is all about, but I'm a big believer in, in having those conversations and communication. So if it's a, a conflict between two people, say, where there's um, something going on, I might you know, ask each of them individually when tempers are down or people aren't so um, invested in, in that moment, um, what's going on and if they'd like to talk about it um, and then ask them if they'd like to talk about it together right but I think the first thing to do is to, to wait till it's the right space and then be brave right ask those questions learn for yourself how you deal with conflict and then try and keep yourself in that space of you know uh, I'm mediating this I'm the one who's just sort of it's not my conflict I want to explore it with them if it's not your conflict and and be being brave and, and find that calm right time to, to ask those questions and to explore it with them great um we're definitely getting a bunch more questions coming in um so do you have any specific recommendations for working through conflict with a supervisor oh that's always a tough one um, so it depends on the supervisor. Like I've met some supervisors and I've had some supervisors. Like my supervisor right now, if I had a conflict, I would feel totally comfortable going to them and saying, hey, here's my challenge. Here's the, here's the, the, the issue I think we're having. Let's talk about it together. Now I know you cannot do that with every, every uh, manager that's out there. And so I think that first step is figuring out do you have that relationship with that person so you can have that conversation? If you can't, what are your other potential avenues, right? Is there a way that um, your department might, you know, do some conflict training for everyone? So it's not as much about, hey, we're having this conflict, but it's about, hey, we all know conflict training is important. Let's see if we can have that conversation. Is there another leader that you can safely you know, bring into the conversation to support you, or maybe, you know, HR is the right um, department that, that they have someone who can sort of mediate that for you. And so I think looking at what your options are in terms of who's the right person to support you, right? It, and I'm, I'm taking this from the, the perspective of, I want to have a better connection with my, my, my supervisor and, and work through this with them. Who's that person who can be that neutral to, to help us work through that together, who is going to be maybe accepted by that leader as the right person um, to have that. But that's, that's, that can be a challenging one for sure. Mm -hmm. And I definitely do see a couple follow-up questions um, after that. So we may have to do um, a different way to answer some of these because there's there seems to be a lot of questions about that. So if that is specifically a topic that you're interested in, do let us know. Um, but for potentially the last question that we we might have time for two, um, may, might just need to be one. Um, does do we have any training for how to use the MBTI when approaching conflict? Um, so I would say we don't have a formal training. That we offer i mean it, we do have obviously the mbti certification but it is something with any of our assessments if you would like us to come in and design a training for you the mbti is definitely a great tool to use with conflict as well 
We also have some information about how to use the MBTI and TKI together. And there is a white paper in that on that uh, on our website under our resources um, uh, on our on our title page. So and then maybe that's something, Caitlin, we can provide as well that white paper on deal, uh, how to use the MBTI and TKI together because mm -hmm. I know we do have that. Definitely. Okay, so I know we are at the top of the hour here, so um, we aren't going to be able to answer all these other ones live, but we will go through these. Um, Marta and I will go through these and we will get answers back to you because there are some really great questions in here. Um, and if we're seeing a lot of similar themes, we'll go ahead and share those those questions and answers with the broader group as well. So if there's anything else that you are interested in, any other questions you're thinking of that you, you're not necessarily going to throw into the questions box, you can always send us an email as well um, and we'll be able to, to get those answers over to you as well. And you can reply to the email with the recording in the slides too if that's a better option for you. So um, I think that's going to be it for all of the questions that we can take we will be sending out the slides and the recording um so just go ahead and look out for that email and otherwise i just want to go ahead and thank you marta for your time today this was really interesting and i appreciate that very much so thank you so much everyone have a great rest of your day thank you all